Uh, tonight's lecture is titled, quote, Wicked Conduct, The Mill Girl and the Murder That Capti Captivated Rhode Island. Miss Cornell, as many of you know, was a 30-year-old Fall River mill worker who was found on December 21st, 1832, hanging from a fence post in a part of Tiverton, Rhode Island that would later become part of Fall River, the area of South Park, what is today Kennedy Park. Hours after her burial, a note was found at her boarding house. If I should be missing, inquire of the Reverend Mr. Avery of Bristol, he will know where I am. Uh, our lecturer tonight is Rory Raven, the author of a book on that crime and the emotional trial that followed. Hello! Hi! Hello. Uh, my name is Rory Raven, uh, and I've been asked to come down here tonight uh, and talk about the murder of Sarah Cornell. But before I, I do that, uh, let me talk about me for a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, back in 2000, uh, I started up a walking tour in Providence called the Providence Ghost Walk. And although I pitch it as a haunted history tour, it's kind of really uh, a history tour, thinly disguised as a ghost tour. Uh, I spend time walking up and down Benefit Street telling people about the haunted history uh, of Rhode Island. I concentrate on, on history, literature, and folklore. Uh, I am not one of these paranormal types. Uh, you've all seen these guys on TV, right? These guys who run around in the dark and talk about orbs and EVPs, and you go, oh, dude, it's wicked haunted, run! Right? You've seen these guys? Yes. That's not me. That's not me. I'm interested in the history, the literature, the folklore. Uh, stories that have been passed down generation after generation. Uh, so I had done this tour for a couple of years. Uh, it was more successful than it had any rights to be. And after a few years, I got an email from a publisher, the History Press, down in uh, South Carolina. And they said, would you like to write up your, uh, your tour uh, as a book uh, and preserve the stories that you tell? I said, absolutely, that'd be great. So that was uh, my first book, uh, Haunted Providence, Strange Tales from the Smallest State, uh, relating a number of the uh, stories that I tell on the ghost walk. So now I was an author. Now I wasn't just some guy doing a walking tour, I was an author. And uh, about a year later, the History Press came back to me, and they said, would you like to do a second book? I said, sure, that would be great, uh, but I'm not sure what I'd write about. And they said, well, here's the thing. You're from Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island has this reputation for being uh, a real mafia center. Uh, it was the sort of seat of the New England Mafia for, for decades. Uh, so why don't you write about the Mafia in Rhode Island? And I said, no. <laughs> huh. For at least two reasons. <laughs> One is that I really have no interest in the Mafia at all. Uh, it's not something that gets my, my juices going. And if I'm not interested, I can't get you interested in it, uh, except to write about it. So if I don't care, I can't really get you to care. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, <laughs> A lot of those guys are still around. <laughs> so I said to the publisher, you know, yeah, I'll write the book if you come over and start my car up every morning. <laughs> so looking back over my, uh, my files, uh, I came across this murder from the 1830s. And I went back to the publisher and said, OK, wait, here's this famous case or infamous case that's been largely forgotten. And it happened in the 1830s. Everyone involved is dead, and I'm not going to get in trouble. And uh, they said, OK, do that. Uh, so that became uh, my second book, uh, Wicked Conduct, The Minister, the Mill Girl, and the Murder that Captivated Old Rhode Island. Uh, my publisher really likes to have these jawbreaker uh, subtitles. Um, and that's the, uh, the murder of Sarah Cornell. Um, after that, I wrote two more books, um, one about uh, the Door War, which was uh, an armed rebellion over the expansion of voting rights in Rhode Island back in the 1840s. Uh, the story is so much more interesting than you think it's going to be when you say it's about voting rights in the 1840s. Um, and then after that, uh, I wrote a book called Burning the Gatsby. Uh, the Gatsby, Burning the Gatsby, the Gatsby was a uh, British revenue boat it used to patrol up and down Narragansett Bay. Uh, one night it ran aground and a bunch of uh, forward-thinking colonists rowed out, uh, shot the captain uh, of the boat. Um, you're all over 18. Uh, they shot the captain in the little captain. 
Um, and then burn the boat. This is the first act of armed resistance in the colonies. This is 18 months before the Boston Tea Party. Um, so the revolution, as far as I'm concerned, uh, starts in Rhode Island, not in Boston. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, I went back to the publisher uh, and said I would like to do a book on Samuel Slater, uh, the beginning of uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, here in America, which starts in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, and they said, great, uh, and then they've really never spoken to me again. So, um, still waiting uh, on that. So, uh, I didn't come here to talk about um, books that I haven't written yet, came to talk about uh, Wicked Conduct, uh, The Murder of Sarah Cornell. Now, I'm sure a lot of you already know uh, this story. Growing up here in Fall River, you've probably heard at least bits and pieces of this story. Uh, for some reason, and I don't really know why, uh, but for some reason, this case uh, is eclipsed by Lizzie Borden. Everyone seems to know Lizzie Borden, but people seem to have forgotten about Sarah Cornell, which is strange because the case, what had happened, was every bit as sensational and every bit as uh, widely reported uh, and discussed uh, as the Lizzie Borden trial uh, would be. So I'm not sure why it gets uh, eclipsed uh, by the Lizzie Borden story, but uh, it does. And our story begins uh, in December of 1831. And uh, a man named uh, John Durfee, uh, who is uh, a farmhand. He, uh, he owns uh, a farm. He's uh, driving his creatures, as he calls them, which is his cattle, uh, driving his creatures uh, along through a pasture. Uh, and his farm is on uh, what is now Kennedy Park uh, here in Fall River. And uh, I, I talked to, uh, to some folks who know their history. I talked to the, the administrator there of the park, uh, and she helped me find what's the likely scene uh, this unfolds. And it's sort of the, the uh, northeast corner of the park. It's by the swimming pools and uh, I think basketball courts uh, are nearby. Uh, so it's in that, that region uh, where uh, Joe, uh, John Durfee has uh, bunches of uh, haystacks. And among the haystacks, he finds the uh, partially frozen body of a young woman. And he's understandably freaked out. She's, uh, she's hanging uh, just a few sort of inches from the ground. Um, She's in this kind of weird kneeling position, uh, and she has one hand up like this, and, uh, and, and rigor mortis is set in, so she's sort of stuck uh, in this kind of unfortunate uh, position. Um, he calls for the local coroner, uh, who gathers up a, a small uh, group of men to act as sort of a, a coroner's jury to, uh, to try to figure out what's going on. Um, some other people show up, uh, including uh, a reverend, a, me a Methodist uh, minister, Ira Bidwell, uh, from here in Fall River. And, um, they, they aren't sure who this is. Uh, Bidwell recognizes her, though. Uh, Bidwell says, oh, she's a member of my, used to be a member of my congregation. Uh, she's a woman of bad character. Um, so they, uh, they cut her down. Uh, some women examine her. Um, a, a doctor appears on the scene uh, and says, I, I know her. She was my patient. Um, and uh, it turns out that she had gone to this doctor uh, because she was a few months pregnant uh, at the time. Um, and uh, the story comes out that she seems to have sort of been involved uh, with this Reverend Avery. Uh, back at the boarding house where she lives, they find a, a note on her bandbox, which uh, was mentioned. Uh, if I should be missing inquire of Mr. Avery, or Reverend Mr. Avery of Bristol, he will know where I am. So it's decided that, well, if she's pregnant and she's talking about uh, asking Mr. Avery where I am, uh, clearly Avery is somehow involved. Uh, they eventually, uh, fairly quickly, uh, decide that she has committed suicide. And uh, the, the coroner's jury uh, says that she was uh, induced to commit the crime of suicide uh, due to the wicked conduct of a married man. Uh, they decide that uh, she had been gotten pregnant by this, uh, this married minister who lives in Bristol, uh, and she had been uh, depressed and distraught and decided to hang herself uh, out there in the uh, middle of the haystacks in the middle of winter. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, so uh, suspicion, of course, uh, falls on, on Avery. Um, he, uh, he kind of denies knowing her, but then he says, no, he does know her, and she was kind of a weirdo. Um, and he had some dealings with her, but hadn't seen her. Um, and he, uh, he has this, uh, this story about, well, where were you uh, yesterday, uh, presumably around the time uh, this, this murder uh, or this, this death uh, occurred? Where were you? And Avery says that he, uh, he went on this long walk. He uh, caught a ferry from Bristol over to Aquidneck, uh, and that he, uh, he got to Aquidneck Island and started walking south, uh, and he went by, uh, he stopped in on a, a friend, a parishioner down there, uh, to check with them. He wanted this sort of long walk. Now, Avery was known for going on these kind of long walks. Um, as a Methodist minister, uh, Avery kind of got moved around a uh, lot. This is the way uh, the Methodist ministry worked back then. You would be sort of rotated. Uh, among parishes, among different churches. You would uh, serve for maybe two to three years 
uh, in one, uh, one location before being kind of moved on uh, to another. And this is uh, the way, just the, the way that they handled things. Uh, Methodism, uh, when it was uh, begun uh, decades before, uh, was uh, spread by these circuit riders, as they were called. Um, these ministers who would ride from one place to another spreading the word of Methodism. And uh, Methodism is uh, called Methodism because it's, it's a strict methodical study uh, of religion in the Bible. And um, the ministers would sort of rotate uh, spreading the word. So later when they become a more established, less itinerant church, they still do this kind of, uh, kind of thing. They, they rotate ministers among uh, uh, the parishes, uh, kind of echoing the original, the, the origins uh, of Methodism uh, years before. Now, uh, they are connected. He does own up uh, to knowing her. Um, he said that they, uh, they had crossed paths a couple of times. Uh, she uh, also kind of wandered from one parish to another. Uh, Sarah Cornell didn't have a, a happy life. Uh, she got a ping pong from one mill to another. Uh, she was a mill girl. She, was, uh, she ran looms and, uh, and got ping pong from sort of one, uh, one mill to another. She hasn't really led a very settled life. Um, she, you know, she uh, has started out life uh, planning to be a tailor, a seamstress but can't really uh, get that going. She eventually goes to work for the mill, which seems like a really good idea uh, until you actually start to work for the mills. Mills had this way uh, of sort of keeping you in debt to them. Uh, a lot of mills, uh, you would have heard about this uh, last week, wouldn't you? Um, a lot of mills uh, pay you in credit, uh, which is uh, then only spendable at the, uh, the company store. Uh, and they don't pay you enough to get out of debt uh, to the store, so they always kind of keep you in debt so you can never leave the mill. Um, so she gets a job like this. Uh, she's not very happy. She leaves. She gets another job, another mill, and she kind of ping pongs around. Uh, she ends up in Lowell uh, this is some years, uh, obviously before uh, her death, and uh, she goes to Reverend Avery, who was at that time stationed in Lowell. And she first goes to him uh, to uh, ask if she can have a job as a housemaid. And uh, this is he owns up the, the first encounter he has with her. Uh, so he opens the door one day, and there she is, and she's asking for, uh, for a job as a uh, domestic help, a maid. And, and his statement about this later is, Mrs. A Mrs. Avery, his wife, not being pleased with her appearance, she was not engaged. And when I read that, Mrs. Avery not being pleased with her appearance, she was not engaged, um, that's when I realized, okay, Sarah Cornell was hot. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty young thing, shows up on the doorstep saying, hi, I'm looking for a job as a maid. And the wife says, oh, no, 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 no. So she doesn't get this job as a, as a maid, but she does turn up in Avery's congregation. And uh, in the congregation, she gets kind of a, a reputation. Uh, she gets fined um, in, the, uh, in the, the congregation uh, for swearing and drinking and, and keeping late hours. Um, she seems to be a little bit of a party girl. But she shows up um, religiously, pardon the, the pun, uh, to, uh, to services. So this is something else that she needs to sort of ping pong back and forth between, uh, between this kind of uh, party girl nature that she has uh, and a more uh, deeply religious nature. Uh, I think that she's one of these people who, uh, you know, has a little too much to drink, um, maybe is out a little bit too late and wakes up the next morning and thinks, oh my God, I've got to get straight and, and you know, straighten things out. And I've got to, you know, go to church and, and get my life on track and then maybe finds herself drinking a little bit too much again a week later. Uh, she, in some ways, is her own worst enemy. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, a favorite author of mine, talked about the imp of the perverse, uh, this part of you that is always going to kind of uh, work against you in your own best interest, um, the sort of uh, part of you that uh, ends up wasting your time when you know you're supposed to be doing something. Uh, and I think Sarah Cornell um, has that imp of the, of the perverse, uh, just like Poe did. Poe certainly knew about that, uh, that quality. I think she's someone who kind of keeps screwing herself up. Uh, I think she's someone who can't get out of her own way. Um, and that uh, ends up uh, getting her in trouble. I tend to have a more sympathetic view uh, of Sarah Cornell than some other writers uh, on the topic. Uh, other writers have, uh, have talked about her, her MO uh, and how she's very calculating. And I don't see her as being that organized a thinker. Uh, I think she's kind of stumbling along, uh, feeling her way, trying to, to straighten her life out, but not really, uh, not really able to do so. So he owns up that, that we, we did know each other, um, and, and we wrote some letters back and forth, but really, you know, that, that's, that's all a long time ago, and I haven't seen her in ages. Um, but now, uh, the people, in, uh, so suspicion uh, falls on him. They can't prove this, but, but people start to think, okay, you did this. 
Um, she was pregnant, obviously, with your child, if, if you two were, were involved, uh, and she's pregnant, and she's saying uh, to go check with you, obviously you're involved, you must be the father, uh, it is assumed. Um, so uh, people decide that they need to, to bring this home to Avery. Avery is the, the prime suspect uh, in this death. Um, if she didn't kill herself because of you, maybe you murdered her. Uh, there's some suspicion uh, about uh, exactly how she met her end. So uh, Fall River becomes uh, alarmed. And I've always been sort of uh, intrigued as to why that is. Now, in Fall River back in the 1830s, you would have had, what, thousands uh, of young women uh, working the mills, thousands of mill girls. Uh, but for some reason, Fall River uh, as a city seems to seize on this death. Um, the death of Sarah Cornell, they seem to really take this to heart. I'm not sure why uh, that is, why they seize upon her. Um, but uh, this is sort of one of her own, one of their own. Uh, and they will not let this death uh, go unanswered. <coughs> Fall River rights take some kind of ominous steps um, to, uh, to, to rectify the situation. Uh, they form, they, they have a, a great big uh, meeting uh, downtown, and they, they decide on a course of action. Uh, they appoint two committees. One is the Committee of Investigation, uh, people who are going to look into this crime, find out what's going on, uh, and, and try to bring the guilty to justice. They're going to, you know, uh, they're acting as a sort of uh, information gathering, and, uh, and, and they'll decide a course of action. There's also a more ominous sounding um, committee of vigilance, which is much larger, it's 100 or so people. Um, and these folks uh, patrol, these folks go out on the information gathering uh, front. So the idea is that the uh, committee of vigilance uh, will gather information, hand it over to the committee of investigation, who will then decide uh, what to do. The um, committee of investigation, uh, first thing they do uh, is they get on a boat, they go across the bay uh, to Bristol, and they stream through uh, the streets of Bristol, and they go to Avery's house, and they set up on his lawn. Uh, so there's a hundred or more people standing out on this guy's uh, lawn across the street, down the street, screaming for his head, because they are certain he did this, uh, because it's a mob, and nothing is more certain than a mob. Uh, so they, uh, they know uh, he did this. They're screaming for his, uh, his head. We know you did this. We will bring you to justice. We're going to get you. Um, Avery is understandably petrified. He hides upstairs during all of this. Uh, they bring in some people who, uh, who know, who at least claim uh, to know stuff. Um, there was uh, one was a sailor on uh, a boat, the same boat that brought them over uh, from, uh, from Fall River. Um, who had said that uh, Avery had paid him uh, to deliver a letter to Fall River uh, a few weeks before the, the murder. This is an attempt to uh, connect Avery to Sarah Cornell. Um, and that he, uh, the, the sailor uh, on the boat, said that uh, he had delivered it to, uh, to Sarah Cornell's house, uh, or the boarding house where she was, uh, she was staying. So they're trying to connect uh, the two of them. Obviously, you were exchanging letters just before her death. Uh, this is another log on the fire uh, of your guilt. Um, the Committee of Vigilance um, I guess isn't quite as, uh, as, as scary as, as you might think uh, because the, uh, the boat is docked um, at, uh, there on the, uh, the, the dock side um, and the, the boat uh, sounds its horn, they're about to head back to Fall River. Uh, the uh, Committee of Vigilance in a body heads back to the boat to get on the boat. They don't want to get stuck there in Bristol. Um, and it's time to go home for supper to, uh, to Fall River, so back to Fall River. Now, there was some, there's been, uh, some talk uh, by, uh, by some historians, and I, I didn't look into this too, too much. I wasn't really sure how to go about it uh, exactly. But um, there was some uh, theorizing that part of the reason uh, Fall River uh, takes the Sarah Cornell uh, case to, to heart um, and is so invested in it is that the mill owners don't want this idea uh, going about that uh, mill girls aren't safe and that mill girls can get murdered and nothing will happen. Uh, because if you do that, then people stop coming to look for work in your mill. So there goes your labor force. Uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, idea, uh, one that I wasn't able to really uh, confirm or deny. It could very well be one of the, the factors in play. Uh, the powers that be want this to be dealt with uh, because they don't want that to affect uh, the workforce. They don't want, uh, they, they need those mill girls. They need a steady stream uh, of labor. So they maybe don't want uh, people being discouraged, thinking that the mills are unsafe. Um, so this may be one of the reasons that they, they take this case uh, so much to heart. Um, Avery is eventually, uh, shortly thereafter, um, arrested uh, and examined um, for the, this murder. Uh, by now, they're pretty sure, yes, he's definitely guilty. Um, and he is, he's examined. Uh, they call it an examination. Uh, nowadays, we would call this a probable cause hearing. Uh, they, they question him uh, to see if 
there is sufficient evidence to advance the case on to trying him for murder. So there's a probable cause here. It's actually held on Christmas Day, um, 1831. And uh, back in, in uh, the 1830s, uh, Christmas Day wouldn't have been a particularly big deal. Uh, it would have been sort of business as usual. Uh, would have been a quiet religious sort of holiday, not the big uh, blowout that we have uh, today. Um, so Avery is examined. Uh, a number of witnesses are, are produced um, uh, trying to, uh, they try to trace his whereabouts. Uh, his, excuse, his alibi uh, is that he takes the ferry to Bristol, uh, to, uh, from Bristol to uh, Quidditch Island, uh, to Portsmouth, and then he goes on one of these long rambles, which he was very well known for. And uh, he said he headed south, uh, saw a couple of parishioners, saw a friend, um, and then headed back uh, north on the island, uh, got there too late to uh, catch the ferry back to Bristol, so spent the night there in uh, Portsmouth, um, and then caught the ferry uh, the next uh, morning. So you're trying to uh, confirm or deny uh, this alibi. Um, others uh, say that what he did, uh, the, the uh, prosecution's case, is that he took the ferry uh, from Bristol to Akutuk Island, and then instead of heading south the way he said, uh, they're saying he went east across the bridge into Tiverton uh, up to Fall River uh, to keep a meeting with Sarah Cornell, uh, at which uh, she ended up dead. So two conflicting stories uh, about, uh, about what happened. They uh, eventually, after uh, questioning and having a number of witnesses uh, argue the points back and forth and give uh, various testimony, they decide that there is not probable cause uh, to, uh, to, to uh, send a murder charge uh, to court. They're going to have to let him go. Uh, so they do. Uh, and he heads right back home, uh, being fairly unpopular uh, in the street. Um, it seems divided. Uh, Opinion seems divided as to whether he did this or not. Um, people argue about this, but he heads home with head hung low, I'm sure. Um, and uh, the next day, or a day or two later, um, one of the, the weird figures in this story, and kind of one of my heroes in this story, uh, a man from Fall River named Harvey Harnden. Um, do any of you Fall Riverites know this name, Harvey Harnden? Um, I, I found almost no information about him. He's this shadowy, mysterious figure. Uh, I find him really interesting. Um, Harvey Harnden uh, goes to uh, arrest Avery. Um, he's, he's a sheriff, uh, but he's a sheriff in Fall River. He has no authority in Bristol. Uh, he goes looking for Avery, uh, gets to, uh, to, to, um, to Bristol to, to find Avery and bring him to, he's going to bring him to Fall River, put him on trial there, which makes no sense because the crime's committed in Rhode Island, so uh, Fall River Court would not have jurisdiction. Uh, Harnden doesn't seem to care. He goes to Bristol to, uh, to get Avery. When he gets to Bristol, he gets to Avery's house, Avery's gone. He is absconded from Bristol, uh, as the, the headlines uh, say the next day. Uh, Harvey Harnden, who has no authority, no jurisdiction to do any of this, then sets off after Avery like the freaking Terminator. <laughs> this is the middle of winter. This is December and January of 1832, of 1831 and 1832. Um, he tracks Avery. Uh, through the winter uh, wilderness of New England. He follows him north. He stops at taverns saying, have you seen a man wearing a hat like this, driving this kind of uh, uh, coach? And he, he does eventually uh, track Avery over the course of, of, of several days, uh, tracks him to Ringe, New Hampshire, um, where, uh, he, he, where Avery uh, seems to have fled. He, he uh, Harden gets to Ringe and starts asking people, you know, have you seen uh, a guy who looks like this? Any, any strangers showing up um, that, uh, that you don't know? And he even uh, enlists um, a baker, uh, a baker who delivers bread uh, and baked goods to uh, people's houses, um, who, who mentions, yeah, there is this one guy who showed up. I, I don't know him, but he's down at this, uh, this house here. Um, and uh, it was a house uh, run by uh, or owned by um, a, a Methodist. Uh, who had been a member of Avery's congregation uh, during one of the uh, previous uh, assignments. So, um, Harvey Harden figures this is, this is who it is. This is where Avery is. So he, he gets a couple of uh, hired men. They surround the house. Uh, Harden bangs on the door and demands uh, Reverend Avery. Um, and uh, the, the woman opens the door. Harden pushes his way in and demands the man of the house, uh, you know, where is uh, Reverend Mr. Avery? And the guy says, Reverend Avery? I've never heard of any man such as Reverend Avery. Uh, Harnden pushes past this guy. He goes upstairs, uh, kicks in a door, because he's the freaking Terminator. <laughs> Comes into a, a, a room upstairs. And uh, the room, uh, the windows have been blacked out. 
Uh, there's a little fire going in the hearth. Uh, there's some clothes and a, a bed and some food uh, laid up. Somebody's clearly camping out in this room. Um, so after he, he opens the door, uh, comes in, he looks around and realizes somebody could be hiding out in this room very comfortably uh, for, for several days. Uh, he then opens the door, um, the, the door having opened, uh, he comes in, looks behind the door, and there's Avery. So he says, you're coming with me. And Avery says, okay. <laughs> um, and again, he has no authority to be doing any of this. Uh, he drags Avery downstairs. Uh, they walk by the man of the house who's still going, Avery, I've never heard of anyone named Avery. Well, there he goes. Um, and they drag him back uh, to, uh, to Fall River uh, for trial. Um, and uh, one of the things, um, Harnden uh, publishes uh, a pamphlet uh, detailing the, uh, the pursuit and the capture uh, of Reverend Avery. And it's an incredibly <laughs> tiny print, it's really hard to read. Um, and the one thing I remember uh, from the, the one thing that really sort of stood out in a, a weird sort of way is um, Avery goes along peacefully. Uh, Avery doesn't really struggle with him. He, um, he doesn't try to get away, uh, and they, they head back down uh, to Fall River. They make one stop at Lexington, uh, to the Lexington Commons, Lexington Green. And uh, Harnden gets out of the carriage and goes over to the monument um, and, uh, and stands there for a, a moment, um, look at the monument to the Patriots of the Battle of Lexington, and, and has this kind of, kind of moment of, you know, this is where our country begins. And um, a few years ago, uh, because my, my main line of work is I do a mind reading act, which we can get into later, um, I uh, was doing a show at a library there in Lexington, right across the street from the, the Battle Green, as they call it, and there was that monument. So I kind of went over uh, to have a look at that, and I had this kind of, you know, double history geek moment uh, of, well, this is the Battle of Lexington, this is, this is you know, an impressive, obviously, a, one of the cornerstones of American history uh, right here, and this is also where Harnden stood with Avery in the carriage, maybe over there. Uh, so I got to have this sort of nice double history geek uh, kind of moment. So um, Avery is, uh, is brought back to, uh, to uh, Fall River. Uh, there's a quick examination uh, held there. Uh, some questions are put to him. There is no record uh, of his responses. Um, and then he's brought on to, uh, to Newport uh, and put in jail there. And uh, another examination is held. They decide that there is sufficient evidence uh, for uh, a, a trial, a murder trial. And he is put on trial there uh, in Newport uh, for the murder of Sarah Cornell. Now, the, uh, the prosecution uh, and the defense obviously have widely different uh, versions of the story. Uh, the uh, prosecution's uh, version is that he goes from Bristol to Portsmouth, uh, across to Tiverton, up to Fall River, meets her um, in the dark at night, and uh, murders her, does away with her, uh, and ties her up and leaves her there uh, in the, the, yard, the haystack yard, um, trying to make it look like a suicide, uh, and then runs away, uh, gets back to uh, Portsmouth uh, too late to catch the ferry, stays over, uh, and goes home the next day. That's the uh, prosecution's uh, version of events. They produce witnesses to try to uh, uh, bolster uh, their, uh, their story. The uh, defense say that no, um, he went from Bristol to Portsmouth and then headed south uh, toward Newport, rambled around, uh, saw a couple of people, uh, then headed back up, uh, missed the ferry, and had to stay over and, and went home the next day. And they each start to uh, marshal their forces, for their forces to prove their story. Now, the, um, the prosecution uh, finds a number of people uh, who on, uh, in, uh, in, in Tiverton Fall River, uh, who say that they saw uh, a big man, Avery was kind of a big guy, uh, they say a, a big man in a great big black hat, which was kind of part of the, the um, Methodist minister uniform at that time. And um, there's a fellow who runs a, uh, who has a, uh, he's the, the gatekeeper uh, at a bridge connecting Tiverton uh, to, um, uh, to Portsmouth. And he, uh, he says that, um, uh, somebody had, had passed by uh, earlier in the day, got a big hat, um, and he closed the, the, uh, the bridge at night. Uh, he sort of closed up the gate, but the gate doesn't seem to be a serious obstacle to crossing uh, the bridge. He says the next morning uh, he came down uh, and there were footprints um, along the, the side of the bridge as though somebody had uh, sort of crept along the bridge uh, later that night. And most people assume, well, this is clearly Avery's footprints coming back uh, from, uh, from murdering Sarah Cornell uh, earlier in the night. But they're never proven to be uh, his footprints, but that's what uh, most people seem to think. 
Uh, this is clearly Avery sneaking back, uh, trying to make the ferry, but missing the ferry. Um, there are some other people who say uh, that in the, the area of Tiverton, uh, they saw um, a short woman. Sarah Cornell was about 5'1", 5'2", about 100 pounds. She's kind of tiny. Um, and uh, they say that they saw a, a short woman wearing a, a cloak or a shawl with a hood uh, and a tall man in a big black hat. They were seen together in the neighborhood. Uh, no one can ever really identify uh, and say it was him that I saw with her, but they, they keep saying we saw a, a tall man in a big hat and a short woman in a cloak. Uh, which would vaguely match their description, but would also match the description of a lot of other people. Um, there is sort of a uh, conspiracy theory um, uh, among people, uh, which actually may have some truth to it. Um, the Methodists, the Methodist Church, uh, kind of clubs together to, uh, to help Avery out. And um, there are these, these you know, dark, uh, theories uh, about the, the lengths the, the, uh, uh, the Methodist went to to, uh, to uh, clear Avery and to uh, condemn Sarah Cornell. Stories about her start to come forward, uh, that she was, you know, quote unquote, this bad character, uh, that she was always uh, getting thrown out of church uh, for, for drinking and swearing and for uh, lewd behavior uh, with one or more men. Um, and the, the, the idea is that, well, you know, you're saying that she, she was pregnant, you're saying it was Avery's kid, could be anybody's kid, she was a slut. Um, so that, that's the uh, part of the, the prosecution's um, case. You can't prove it's Avery's kid, she was known to be a woman of loose moral character, this could be anybody's kid, um, and are you gonna uh, believe, uh, you know, a, a mill girl, uh, or this upstanding uh, minister uh, from the community? So. Um, it's very important to the uh, prosecution's case uh, to prove that Avery didn't head to, uh, to Tiverton or Fall River, that he headed south. So they start scouring uh, the countryside looking uh, for people who can, can confirm that Avery headed south. Um, on Aquidneck Island, sort of down the south, uh, they find a woman named Sarah Jones. I love Sarah Jones. Um, Sarah Jones uh, said when she was asked by people looking uh, to, uh, to collect information. Um, she said, well, in the, the morning, uh, I saw a man in a big black hat uh, walk by uh, the, the gate um, of my house. And they seize him and say, okay, you, you said it was uh, um, uh, in the morning, you saw a man in a big black hat. She said, yes. And they said, could you be mistaken? Could it have actually been the afternoon? Because in the morning uh, that day, Bri uh, Avery is still supposed to be back in Bristol. Um, but by the afternoon, he's on Aquidneck Island. So they're, they're trying to convince her that she misremembers this. You must be mistaken. It wasn't the morning that you saw him. You saw him in the afternoon. Isn't that true? And she says, well, no. Um, and they keep leaning on her. Uh, and at one point, one of the, the ministers who's uh, trying to help out with uh, Avery's defense um, says to her, um, how do you know that it was the afternoon, uh, it was the morning and not the afternoon. How can you be certain? And she says, because I can tell the morning from the afternoon. <laughs> um, but they, they bring her into the, they, uh, they bring her to the trial as a witness. Uh, they, they put her on the stand and they, they are going to, to hammer away uh, at poor Sarah Jones uh, until she admits uh, that she saw him uh, in the afternoon, not the morning, but she doesn't. Uh, she, she holds fast. She also reports uh, this really bizarre um, incident. Um, when the body of Sarah Cornell is found, uh, the, the, the noose around her neck is not a noose. Uh, the, the rope around her neck is tied in this kind of peculiar knot called a clove hitch knot. Um, and they, they start, they, they seize upon this idea. Uh, it's not a noose, uh, it's a clove hitch. Now, a clove hitch, I, I used to know how to tie one, um, but uh, a clove hitch is what they call a tension knot. Uh, it's a knot that really only uh, holds tight if it's under tension. Um, it's, uh, it's not good for just tying something loose. Um, what am I talking about? Um, the idea is that uh, the, the defense said that she couldn't have hanged herself using a clove hitch knot. Um, she couldn't have tied this thing around her neck because it would sort of fall apart unless it's under tension. Uh, so it's not a good uh, noose, uh, a good sort of knot to hang yourself with. It is actually a pretty good knot uh, to lash the thing and haul it up into place. Uh, so the, 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 the defense, um, sorry, the prosecution's idea um, is that obviously Avery uh, tied this uh, clove hitch knot around her lifeless body and then hauled her up into place like a side of beef. Um, and uh, the, uh, the defense is saying, well, actually, this clove hitch knot 
is actually very popular among mill girls. Uh, they use this a lot in their work. Uh, sometimes um, in the, the mills and the looms, the, the uh, thread will snap or string will snap. And supposedly, uh, according to the, uh, the defense, uh, the, um, they, uh, the mill girls tend to use this clove hitch knot uh, to, to fix that. So the clove hitch knot, supposedly, uh, is very popular and well known among mill girls. Um, and they, they bring in dozens of mill girls uh, to, uh, to testify that, yes, we use this all the time uh, in our work. When they bring Sarah Jones, this woman from uh, Quinnick Island who saw uh, a man in a black hat in the morning uh, and stays with that story, uh, they put her up in a boarding house uh, with a bunch of the mill girls they brought in to testify. And she later says that uh, the night she's uh, brought there, um, she goes into sort of the common room uh, where she sits with uh, a bunch of the, the mill girls who are also uh, to testify. And she says the mill girls are sitting there practicing clove hitch knots over and over again. Um, trying to get familiar with them. And one of the mill girls actually turns to Sarah Jones and says, do you know how to make one of these? I've never seen one of these knots before in my life. So, um, there are uh, also a number of other um, you know, misidentifications. Uh, there is um, uh, there's a, a waitress at a tavern who says, uh, I saw uh, a man in a big black hat, and it's, uh, it, it, you know, it must be uh, Reverend Avery, I know it's gotta be him, uh, and, and one of the, uh, the uh, one of the lawyers, um, you know, says, well, well, can you point him out uh, here in the, the courtroom? And she points to like three different people, none of whom are Avery. Um, so uh, they have a very hard time proving uh, that Avery uh, was in Fall River that night. But the, the suspicion is generally that he was. Um, after, uh, I think it was two weeks, uh, the trial lasted. Uh, the, the defense, trying to get Avery off, called twice as many witnesses uh, as the prosecution. Uh, and I talked to a couple friends of mine who were lawyers, and, uh, and I said, you know, what, what's your take on this? And they said, well, what they were trying to do was they were really just trying to bury the jury uh, under a mountain of monotonous evidence. Um, and, and juries can be swayed uh, thinking, well, whichever side talks longer must be right. Uh, you simply wear the jury down uh, by talking at length. Uh, so the, um, uh, the defense uh, talks uh, in, in brings in uh, twice as many witnesses uh, as the prosecution uh, and wears the jury down. Um, and uh, closing arguments last for hours. The closing arguments for the defense uh, go, into, go to, uh, two, uh, to 2 a.m. Uh, on a Sunday. Um, and uh, the jury uh, is sequestered and fairly quickly returns a, uh, a verdict of uh, not guilty. Uh, and Avery is released. Um, and then, uh, then he, he tries to go back to life as, as normal, uh, but how could you possibly uh, go back to life, uh, a normal life after that? Uh, he's now infamous. Uh, he had never been a terribly popular preacher uh, there in, uh, in Bristol, but now he was, because everyone wanted to show up and go to church at the, uh, the, the church overseen by the minister who killed that girl. Um, so uh, he becomes uh, a little bit of a liability. Uh, people actually start following him in the street, calling him names. There's a story about him uh, going up to Boston uh, and doing some shopping, going into a uh, 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 store. And uh, when he turned around, as he was about to leave the store, a massive crowd had gathered in the street. Uh, he was unable to even get out the door. They had to call on the police to sort of disperse uh, the crowd. He uh, then went to, uh, to Lowell as a guest uh, preacher. Now, Lowell is where this all begins. This is where he first meets Sarah Cornell. And uh, when he goes uh, to Lowell, when he arrives there, um, mill girls walk out of the mills in protest uh, because they know he did it. Um, and when he gets to Lowell, uh, they have set up a, um, an effigy, um, a, a haystack in uh, the middle of town uh, with a sort of sinister uh, figure in a big hat uh, standing next to it. Um, so he, he understands uh, that, that uh, public opinion is very much against him. He may have uh, beaten a murder rap, uh, but public opinion uh, is still very much against him. Uh, and we still see this sort of thing uh, today. Um, but Avery you know, maintains uh, his innocence. And um, the, uh, the Methodists hold their own, um, uh, their own uh, tribunal, their own inquiry. Uh, and of course, clear him, say, we, we clear you of any wrongdoing. You have nothing to do with the, the murder of that, uh, that poor, unfortunate woman. Um, you're innocent in the eyes of the uh, Methodist Church. 
He uh, moves on from Bristol. Um, he, uh, he gets moved around uh, once or twice, and then he decides that when his latest assignment uh, is completed, he's not going to put in for reassignment. He, he decides that really uh, this is all too much. Uh, wherever he goes, he attracts huge attention. And uh, he heads out west, uh, takes up farming, uh, and dies out in Ohio, uh, hoping that people uh, have forgotten about her, uh, him and her. Um, but the story still uh, goes around. Uh, he's obviously very well known uh, among many others. Um, there uh, was a, uh, I, I love this because it's so bizarre. There was a traveling exhibition uh, of wax figures of famous murderers uh, that was going around. Uh, and it was in Boston. And Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, went to this exhibit. And when he went there, he marveled at the, uh, the, the sinister figure of Avery and the poor quaking figure uh, of Sarah Cornell uh, and, and a haystack uh, that was uh, there at this exhibition. Um, so kind of creepy and weird, but, but famous enough uh, that uh, a sort of traveling uh, Madame Tussaud kind of show uh, would have included uh, those two figures. A number of years later, and I just find this bizarre, um, a number of years later, uh, when P.T. Barnum uh, is, is getting going as a showman. He's traveling around uh, with his circus, with his, his, uh, his collection of oddities, his sort of sideshow. Um, he pulls into uh, one town down south, and uh, he's been doing pretty well for himself. He's got some money, and he's P.T. Barney. He's kind of a, a show-off uh, to begin with. He goes to a local tailor. He gets himself a new black suit, uh, and he's feeling you know, very successful, very entrepreneurial, uh, and he's walking down the street, uh, this, this uh, southern city, uh, wearing his fancy new uh, black suit, and his uh, friend and partner in the circus uh, goes into a tavern uh, and, uh, and points to, uh, to Barnum you know, strutting out in the streets uh, and says to the guys in the tavern, I can't believe you're letting that guy walk around like that down here. And the guys in the bar tavern say, well, what are you talking about? And, and Barnum's friend says, that, that's Avery. That's the guy that killed that girl. Just let him walk around here? That would never happen up north. We would never let that. Tavern empties out. They go after, uh, they go after Barnum. Uh, they proceed to try to ride him out of town on a rail. I always thought that was just sort of a weird uh, turn of phrase. I always thought that it must mean um, that, uh, that a railroad track must be involved somehow. I never really understood what the, where the phrase comes from until I found out. Um, riding somebody out of town on a rail. You go to a three rail fence, you get one of the rails, you force it between their legs, you hoist them up, uh, and you run them out to the edge of town and dump them. Uh, this is where being ridden out of town on a rail uh, comes from. Um, so they grab a rail and they go after Barnum, and Barnum's saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Barnum, I'm the circus guy, I'm not the murderer. Uh, and it takes a lot of convincing uh, before they, they let him go. Um, and then, understandably, things are somewhat frosty between Barnum and his friend uh, for some time after that. Um, so uh, the court of public opinion to this day really holds that, uh, that Avery was guilty. Um, that he, uh, he had gotten her pregnant um, during one of their, their sort of liaisons, um, and, uh, and that he, he panicked. Uh, being you know, a pillar of the community, uh, an established man, he couldn't let some pregnant mill girl uh, be ruining his life. Uh, he had a, a wife, he had some children, um, and you know, he had too much to lose. Uh, consensus of opinion uh, among historians is that he may have tried to induce an abortion. When well, that didn't work, uh, he freaked out and uh, maybe strangled her. Uh, that he had arranged to meet her uh, out there in the, the, wood, in the, the fields uh, near to where she lived, um, hoping to, to clear this up. But when that didn't work, uh, he freaked out and killed her. Uh, that's the sort of consensus of opinion. Um, I, I tend to lean that way myself. I think he was guilty. Um, but with that being said, I don't think I could have convicted him if I were on the jury. Because he can never be conclusively placed with her that night. There are plenty of people who say, well, I saw a tall guy in a big hat and a short woman with a cloak together that night. But there doesn't seem to be any really smoking gun proof. Uh, I mean, it certainly sounds uh, like they were together. It certainly sounds like he's the guilty party. Everything kind of, kind of links up. Uh, the, the circumstantial evidence, as they call it, um, all lines up. I, I asked one of my lawyer friends, I said, look, what, what is circumstantial evidence and, and why is it always bad? Uh, you know, I've, I've watched enough law and order um, to know that they say, well, that's entirely circumstantial. Uh, and then the, the case goes nowhere. And my friend uh, Dan said that circumstantial evidence really is the only kind of evidence there is. Uh, he says that circumstantial evidence is simply evidence that makes you draw a conclusion from it. 
Um, so you know, people would say, well, you know, when you produce a gun, that's the smoking gun. That's that's the, the hard physical proof. But Dan says, no, it's actually still circumstantial because you're drawing a conclusion that that smoking gun was the murder weapon. Um, so uh, if you look at the case, there's all kinds of suggestions that clearly they were probably together that night. Uh, but we can't really produce anybody who can definitely place them uh, together conclusively. Um, so. Sad to say, if I were on the jury, I would have had to err on the side of caution and say, I didn't think he did it, even though I think he did. Uh, but I can't prove it. I can't, you can't place them together conclusively. Um, and like I said, uh, people today are pretty convinced uh, that he did it. When I started to uh, research the, the third book, The Door of War, the one about the voting rights, um, I found the, uh, the guy in Rhode Island who was the expert on the Door Rebellion. Um, the Door Rebellion is called the Door Rebellion, the Door of War, just led by a guy named Thomas Wilson Door, D-O-R-R. -R. Uh, he's a leader for voting reform. Uh, so it becomes known as the Door War. Uh, so I found uh, a guy who named Rusty Simone, and Russ is the collector uh, on the Door War. He's the expert. He probably has Door's baby shoes. And um, he had a broadside, or a number of broadsides, uh, published about the Cornell case uh, in the years after the, the verdict. And he had a, broad, a broadside I had never seen before. Uh, so I was trying to figure out how can I roll this up and put it in my coat uh, and sneak out. Um, so he showed this to me. I said, oh, well, I wrote a book about it. He said, yeah, I know. I've, I've got the book right here, which is very flattering of him. Uh, so we talked about uh, the Cornell case for a minute. And I, I remember Russ just sort of shaking his head and saying, yeah, that guy was guilty. Uh, I said, well, yeah, I think he probably was. Uh, but unfortunately, um, he couldn't be conclusively uh, placed, even though it certainly seems uh, like he was guilty. So uh, that's the, the very quick uh, version of the, uh, of the case. Um, there are a number of other you know, bizarre uh, episodes. Uh, they try to trace his movements, and there's letters that they're tracing, and what do the letters mean? Um, so it's an interesting case. Uh, it was uh, very much the OJ case of today. Uh, this was a big case everyone talked about. Uh, it's got international press reported in uh, the English newspapers uh, at the time. Uh, this was a huge big deal, and we've forgotten about it. Uh, for the most part, uh, except for you know, weird historians like me. Um, like I said, for some reason, it's eclipsed by the Lizzie Borden murder. I don't know why, uh, but, uh, but it is. Oh, one other little thing I should throw in before I, I try to wrap up. Um, when you read up on this case, there are a number of claims, uh, a number of people claiming that uh, Sarah Cornell was related to Lizzie Borden, but that doesn't seem to wash. She might be, but we don't know. Um, there are, uh, I guess Lizzie Borden had an ancestor named James Cornell from this family. Um, and uh, Lizzie Bo um, Sarah Cornell's father was James Cornell. Uh, but we don't know that that James Cornell was the related to Lizzie Borden. Um, there are a number of guys named James Cornell from around the same time, um, all of whom are about the right age to have been uh, Sarah Cornell's father. Um, but we don't know that, that Lizzie Borden's James Cornell is also um, uh, Sarah Cornell's James Cornell. Um, so a lot of people claim that uh, they're, they're related, but we don't know uh, that they are. They might be, but they might not be. Uh, so that's the quick version of the story. Uh, I am more than happy to, uh, to take uh, questions. Um, if you have any, uh, anything I haven't made clear, which is probably the case. Yes? What happened to Mrs. Avery after the arrest? Uh, she's a really shadowy figure, even more so than Harvey Harnden. Um, she sticks with him. Uh, the only thing we really know, uh, the only story that we really have about her is that when he was uh, finally acquitted uh, and sent home to Bristol, uh, he came walking up the, the street uh, and she was said to have been sitting on the porch or in the front uh, window of the house and fainted upon seeing him come up the street. Uh, that is really the only thing that, uh, that we know about her. She's a really uh, shadowy figure uh, in the, the whole story. Yes? Where did they bury Sarah? Um, she is buried um, in the same cemetery as Lizzie Borden. Uh, yep, uh, not far uh, either. Um, and I, I went out there um, when I was writing the book. Uh, I went out there and um, I got there and the office was closed and the office had a, a note that said call this number. So I call that number uh, and I get a groundskeeper. Um, and I said, I'm looking for a particular grave. And they said, okay, I'll be right there. Uh, and, and five minutes later, the guy shows up and says, what grave? And I said, I don't know like the number or the plot, but it's, it's, it's Sarah Maria Cornell. Uh, and he says, the mill girl. I said, yeah. Um, so he says, yep, come on. Um, so we hop in his truck, and he, he takes me out there. Um, so he knew right where it was. 
Um, and uh, so she's uh, buried uh, Oak Grove, is that? Um, so not, not too far from Lizzie Borden. Um, but uh, I mean, not too far, but not real close either. She's kind of uh, uh, tucked away in the back. I guess Lizzie is in a much nicer section. Uh, and Sarah seems to be kind of out in the, the, the marches. Um, sorry? She's in the family plot. Yeah, Lizzie is. OK, yeah. Um, she, uh, Sarah was, was buried on um, uh, Durfee's land for a long time. Uh, but um, people kept coming by uh, looking for the grave. Uh, and he, he eventually, uh, they eventually moved her out to, uh, to Oak Grove. So uh, that's that section. And her, her grave sounds very hard to read. Uh, but it's, it's there. Yes? Um, I'm trying to recall. I'm spending a little time. Um, but didn't Avery give um, that the man at the gate um, a note or a letter? I don't know if it's the man at the gate. A note or a letter or something like that? Yep. And um, I forget what happened with that. I mean, I know that like when they were trying to backtrack and everything, they actually went to the stationery store and you know tried to link it and everything like that. But I forgot what it was about the note that was presented in, um, you know, as evidence. Yep, there's a couple letters that, uh, that, they, they, that are produced. Um, there's one letter uh, that a, a sailor on this boat, King Philip, um, is, says uh, he was in Providence and uh, docked in Providence and a guy, he says in a big hat, um, comes to him and gives him a letter uh, and then gives him uh, a coin and says, bring this to Fall River and bring this to this house. Uh, the stand says, well, the, the, the post box right there on the, on the deck, put it there. And he goes, no, 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 I really want you to take this to this house. Um, so that when the sailor does, this is to the, ends up being, uh, going to the uh, boarding house where Sarah Cornell lives. Uh, so they're trying to make that Avery communicating with her uh, that way. There's another letter um, setting the, the, uh, the assignation uh, where, jeez, oh, it's, it's a, a letter that, um, I think it's, as I recall, um, it's, 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 a, it's a half sheet, um, and there's a, a stationary store that they trace it to uh, in Fall River. And um, they, they find another, like the matching half sheet, yeah. um, and, and the, the, the guy um, in the, the store says, you know, I don't know, uh, I, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a mysterious figure who came over and was like, like, like fiddling in my paper for a while and then walked back out, so maybe he planted it there. Um, because Avery was in the store the day before uh, with his friend Bidwell. Uh, and Bidwell went to check the stagecoach, I think, uh, leaving Avery alone in the store for a few minutes. So Avery could have grabbed a piece of paper uh, to write this other note on. Uh, but yeah, the, the story uh, is that, yes, yeah, some mysterious man came and must have shoved that in there. Because uh, I don't know how that got in there, um, even though it, it clearly matches. Um, so again, it's, it's the, the lengths uh, that. Uh, the defense was going to to try to uh, get Avery off. Yes? How did the prosecution hand the letter up by Sarah that said Avery more or less uh, killed him? Sorry? The letter that Sarah left? Yep. That said Avery would know who she was. How did right. the prosecution handle that? Put that to the side. Um, no, they, they're definitely, they definitely make the case that this links the two of them that they had, you know, an assignation that night. They were supposed to meet uh, that very night. Um, there are other, another letter that uh, gives specific instructions about meet me tonight where we met before uh, and all this sort of thing. Um, and uh, so, so they, they're, they're trying to get those uh, uh, you know, in evidence. Um, if they can't, they actually, there's one letter that her, um, her family has where she talks about uh, meeting Avery uh, and, and where she kind of lays out the story um, that uh, they had met at one of these camp meetings. Methodists have these camp meetings. Um, and it's kind of like a religious, religious, religious revival, a uh, big meeting out in the woods where there's, you know, hymns and, and fiery speeches. And um, uh, she lays out the story. Uh, they met out there, and she, you know, wants her letters back from him because she had apparently written him some compromising letters. Um, and uh, he apparently more or less says, well, I'll give them back to you if, um, and this is where she gets pregnant. Uh, so um, she lays the story out, uh, the, they won't let that letter into evidence, uh, so her family <laughs> takes it and publishes it in the newspaper, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so yeah, the, the letters are, are a big deal, um, evidentiarily, so. Anything else? Yes, all the way back. How long was the trial? Oh, geez, you gotta ask me that. Uh, two weeks, I believe, or more. Uh, I don't remember offhand. Um, 
So someone, uh, someone who has my book is now going to make me look stupid. Um, but it was, it was a couple of weeks. Um, and it was like 150 witnesses being called. And it was just it was absurd. Uh, so anybody else? Yes? It's pretty clear this, listening to you that this case puts its finger right on a lot of sensitive places. The difference between the rich and the poor, men and women, uh, classes, uh, the supposedly high reputation of a minister, right. and the terribly, perhaps low reputation of a mill girl. Right. But I'm wondering also, and I don't know, I mean, today, if, if a girl's found murdered in Kennedy Park, we don't even blink. But in 1832, how many murders were there? Where, was, is it possible that the citizenry went crazy because this was an unusual event? Certainly. Uh, I don't know what the, the crime statistics are for you know, 1832, but I, I would assume that it, it's not, you know, we're talking about Fall River in the 1830s, where, or Tiverton in the 1830s. We're not talking about Baltimore or Detroit um, today. So yeah, I, I'm sure part of it is simply that, that there was a lower crime rate or a lesser crime rate uh, back then, at least to some extent. Uh, so yeah, I think some of the, the, the simple fact that it was uh, a murder at all, and then such a lurid one. Uh, yeah, you know, the idea that he seems to have strangled this woman and then hauled her into place like a side of beef, and that she's half frozen when they find her, and that she's, you know, pregnant. Um, so it, it's got all the kind of uh, lurid uh, details uh, that make for you know a good story. Um, so yeah, I think that's got to be part of the reason that uh, people latched onto it. Um, and and you you kind of uh, make a, a good point as well. There are a lot of uh, you know hot button topics uh, in there, and and I I tend to, uh, to stick to, to, to stories. Um, I, I'm kind of interested in what happened and how it happened and who, who did what and what happened afterwards. That's always been my, my approach to these, these history books. Um, you know, I'm not an academic. I never even finished college. Uh, so I'm not one of these uh, you know, Marxist deconstructionists who wants to explain what the culture, you know. Um, there, there are some people who say that, well, you know, Avery was a representative of, of patriarchy and of the, uh, the establishment, and, and she was a woman who was apparently a little free uh, with herself, uh, so she was stepping outside of the bounds of the culture, so Avery had to sort of step in uh, and bring her to heel, um, and I really don't think that that was going through his head um, when this happened. Uh, I think if you could, you know, beam down into that uh, field that night that they're there um, and say to him, well, first, stop him from doing it, um, and then secondly, say to him, what are you doing here tonight? I think he would never say, oh, well, as a representative of uh, patriarchal culture, I need to, uh, to administer justice and bring this, uh, this, this uh, outlier uh, back into the, I, he would not say that sort of thing. He would probably say, she's pregnant, she's going to ruin my freaking life. <laughs> um, and, and that to me is sort of uh, the story. So I, there are a lot of uh, you know, hot button issues, uh, in it, and they're definitely there, uh, but I, I you know, I, I, I think those are, are in play, but I'm, I'm not one of those folks who wants to take one of these big, crazy, French theorist uh, kind of approaches to things. Um, I'm interested in, in the people and the story and what happened. Uh, that, that, that's sort of enough. Um, you know, years ago, I read a, an article by Robert B. Parker, the guy who wrote the Spencer books, uh, and he was a, uh, a, a, an English professor for a number of years. And he talked about how um, he would teach detective fiction when he was a, an English teacher. And he said that uh, when you're an academic, you have to take whatever it is, detective fiction in his case, and link it up to something else. Uh, and then it becomes OK to talk about in the college classroom. So he said his thing was um, they wanted you to take mystery fiction uh, and look at it in terms of Marxism. Uh, that it was you know, the honest proletariat uh, trying to restore order, going up against the corrupt cops and the corrupt elites uh, and bring justice to the, the higher ups who were uh, were corrupt. And he said, no, this is complete nonsense. But this was the game that you had to play. Um, so I, when I look at this case, I'm interested in, in her and him and what happens and what it does tell you about you know, social class and, and that sort of thing. But I'm, I'm not interested in, in upping that game too, too high. Because then you're not focusing on them. And, and to me, they're the real story. So uh, anybody else? Yes? Didn't, didn't even realize that they couldn't drag him back and forth from New Hampshire and just himself? He just went along with it. That, that's one of the weird things. Yeah, just, uh, he, yeah he, he never seems to realize that Harvey Harnden has no authority. <laughs> um, and he, he just kind of goes along with it. Uh, so that's a, one of the, the puzzles um, of, the, of the thing for me. Well, like if he's trying to prove his innocence, I'll go with you, or, you know? Maybe. I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, what he's that thinking. That would be my idea. Right. I think. Uh, so. Wasn't this a big 
big enough case that it caused the city to change its name? That's one of, that's one of the stories. Um, I don't know if that's really the case. That That's more more of a question, I think, for you foreigner historians. Uh, but yeah, there's, um, there's, there's a story about uh, about the city changing its name to, to get away from, from that. Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but it certainly could be. So, anybody else? Thank you.